James chapter number 2. We'll begin reading in verse number 14. The Bible says, What doth it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he have faith, and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, if it hath not works, it is dead. Yet, even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Right, we'll stop reading there. Very familiar passage of Scripture. Off, you know, a couple of verses in what we just read are off-quoted. I mean, just people, it is part of, I guess you could say, modern-day Christianity nomenclature that people know faithful that works is dead and the devils believe but they fear and tremble I mean you'll hear that preached you'll hear it quoted you'll hear it referenced to but there's a whole lot more going on in these verse than just what people like to quote okay I mean look at verse number 14 what does the prophet of man if he say he hath faith and he have not works can faith save him I mean brother Brian we've used the analogy around here before if I had an envelope right here it said brother Brian on it I said, Brother Brian, there's a million dollar check in there and an all ex exclusive, you know, paid trip to Hawaii or Fiji or wherever you want to go. Right? And not just for you, but you can take Miss Veronica with you too. If you want to. Or you, I can give you the cash for that part of it. You can go alone. Okay? <laughs> but I can tell you, I, I can lay it down on the table up here. I can ask it, do you believe that there's a check for a million dollars in there and an all expense paid trip? You could say, yeah. You can believe it until you die. But unless you come and get that envelope, it's not going to do you any good. But even once you get the envelope, you got to open it up. Having the envelope isn't going to get you to Hawaii or wherever you want to go. And then, even if you opened it up, just looking at the check, it ain't going to put it in the bank account. You got to sign the back of it. You got to endorse it. You got to take it over to the bank, fill out a deposit slip, say, hey, I want this to go into my account. That's what James is trying to get across here. The devils believe, but that's not faith. The Bible says that man's without excuse not to look around and see everything that God has made and not know that there's a God. That the very soul of man knows that we were created by something Amen. greater than ourselves. We can look around and know that nothing was made by anything else that we see. It's too great a work. Too complicated for man to do. And we know that there is a God. So knowing or saying that we believe isn't the thing. It's about putting our faith in what we say we believe. He says faith isn't enough to just say, well, okay, I believe. Well, I mean, that's the track that we put out. That's the, I mean, Brother Bob used to. I don't know if he still does. He's got a piece of white paper about that long, 18 inches in front of the Bible. What's that? That's the difference between the head and the heart. That's how often... Or that's how so many people often miss heaven. They think it, they know it, but they don't believe it. They have faith that it's true, but they don't have faith that it can save them. Okay, then, before y'all die on me, look at verse number 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace... Be ye warmed and filled, warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful of the body. What doth it profit? In other words, if Brother Ray were to come to me and say, "You know what, Brother Jordan? I just walked outside and found out that I got a flat tire. I ran over a nail or something because he's retired now and he's tinkering in his driveway and he ran over a nail that he dropped." Right? Well, I can say, "You know what, Brother Ray? I've got faith that God's going to take care of that for you." Little does he know, I've got one of them things I can plug it into that cigarette lighter in my car and it, it's got a little tiny compressor in there. Is it going to fix it? No, but it might be able to get him back home. Might be able to get him to the tire store. That's what this verse is saying. You know what, Brother Ray, I believe if you pray hard enough, God will fill that tire up with air. I know that God's going to sort it out for you, but what if God wants to use you to sort it out for him? Amen. What if you have the means because God's been so good to you and God knew that so he sent them by your way. I, guess, I mean, 
any kind of tragedy. I'm not on social media because it drives me nuts. But every now and then I do get a little hint of what's going on on social media. For instance, I mean, not too long ago, what was it? It was uh, Kobe Bryant and his daughter. People everywhere on Twitter, thoughts and prayers. I believe God's going to come for you. Well, what if God wanted you to go comfort? It's easy to say, well, I believe God's going to help you. It's easy to say, oh, I'll pray for you. It's easy to say, you know what, my thoughts go out to you. What's that? That's a head knowledge. If you were really touched, like Jesus was touched with the feeling of our infirmity, if you were touched with a burden for that person, your faith would have works attached to it. Do you really believe God's going to help them? Because if you believe so, you'll say, you know what, I know God's going to work all this out, so I'll step in and do it now because I believe that if I do it and it's God's will, that he'll give it back to me. Or I'm not going to miss it if I give it to you because that's how good he is. That's the way that faith works. But logic says, well, I wish I could help him, but if I give it to him, then I'm not going to have it. And what if I need it? Well, is God God? Is he not still on the throne in heaven? If God said do it, or if you believe that it's the right thing to do, because God orchestrated it to where you could do it, if you really believed it, you'd do it, regardless of the consequences. Because that's faith. But telling somebody, you know what, I hope it all works out for you. Now, if you don't have the means to meet, I mean, that's one thing. I'm not saying, you know, take food off of your table to give somebody. I'm not saying that. It's just saying, if you have the ability and you don't. Because what did he say in verse number 16? He said, you give them not those things which are needful to the body. It's not saying go out and buy them a multi-million dollar house. It's saying give them blankets. Give them, a, you know, some clothes. Give them a place to sleep for the night. Right? Well, I can't do much for you, but I got a couch. I can't do much for you, but I mean, I've got one extra can of Campbell's soup in the, in the cabinet. Those things which are needful, you'd give to them. Right? And I mean, really, if you love somebody, I firmly believe that you would go without to see somebody that you love go with. I mean, Christ not only gave up his life, shed his blood, became the propitiation for our sin. Christ went with that. He broke fellowship with the Father so we could have fellowship with God. He went without so we could have. But if you really believe that it's God, then you're not going to go without. If it's God's will, you won't even miss it. I mean, did he not say, you know, if we give unto God what's God's, see if he doesn't open the windows of heaven, pour out a blessing upon us. Press down, shaking, bubbling over. But then, verse number 17, Even so faith, if it have not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee by faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God that doest well, the devils also believe, and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Now see, there are a lot of people some of them Baptists, some of them not Baptists, they have real problem with these verses. Right? A lot of them wear white shirts, black ties, ride around on bicycles, knock on your front door and say, do you have a moment to talk about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? I've never run into one, but I'd love to say, yeah, let me tell you about Jesus. I don't think they'd stick around too long. But, others, you know, think that if their works whether it's putting a whole bunch of fertilizer in a car and blowing it up in front of a building, will get them to their version of paradise where they get 72 virgins. A lot of it's about works. Throughout the Middle Ages, really all the way up until about the Renaissance and after, in some cases, there's one organization that taught about penance, that you had to punish yourself in order to be forgiven for sins. Nowadays, they've replaced that with just saying a whole bunch of Hail Marys and Our Fathers. But they would take whips, or they would take uh, pieces of leather with metal studs and fragments in it, and they would whip their backs till they bled, because they thought that through their suffering, they could attain forgiveness for their sin. And even before that, and then up until not too long ago, they 
taught that, you know, if you gave enough money, they could pray your relatives out of purgatory or out of hell. Show me chapter and verse on that one. You can't, because the Pope came up with it. But they honestly would say, well, if you pay this much, that'll get this person out of hell. I'm not talking about that. Okay? I know us. We got that doctrine. That works do not save you. But he's not talking about salvation here. He's talking about victorious Christian living. He's talking about saved people living a life before God that is holy and righteous. And what he's saying is a lot of people think, I mean, we can go over to Galatians chapter number 3. The chapter starts off with, oh, you, oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? He said, you started in the Spirit, so what makes you think that the works of the flesh would justify you to God after you get saved? I'm not justified by what I do. I'm justified because of what Christ did. But then on the other side, you got people that think, well, works is where it's at. And then you've got others that say, well, faith's where it's at. And James is saying, yes and no. If you really got faith, you'll have works. But just because you have works doesn't mean you have faith. If you take any of those other denominations or any of those sects that teach it's in work, if you say, well, if you couldn't do those things. Because, I mean, in their doctrine... Does the Bible change if you're in a wreck and you don't have the ability to use your legs anymore? What if you were on a horse like Christopher Reeves and then for the rest of your life you can't move from the neck down? Well, what if you can't go? What if you can't do? That's a very extreme example of what this verse is talking about. Yea, a man say, Thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. That person's going to be miserable. Because they think that their hope, they think that their eternal security is caught up in what they can do. Then on the other hand, James doesn't say, and I'll show you my faith without my works. No, he says, I'll prove it to you by my works. There are a bunch of people that say, well, I believe. Well, prove it. How can you prove it without some type of action? See, that's where modern day theology gets it wrong. Faith and works are tied together. If you believe it, you'll do it. Because if you just say, well, I believe, well, obviously not enough to do it. The devils can believe all day long. They can't get saved. They know there's a God. You forget, a third of them were in heaven. Kicked out of heaven, and then those are the devils in hell that are the followers of the devil, of Satan. They saw God. Some of them may have used to sing praises to God. They know He's real. But yet, their knowledge doesn't help them. And see, nowadays, modern day Christianity, very little faith. Galatians 3, it's written, the just shall live by faith. The Bible tells us to seek His face. How do we do that? Through faith. But here, James, faith without works is dead. So with the Lord's help, we're going to teach on this morning, how alive is your faith? How alive is your faith? We've got the analogy that our pastor's given. That thing had no legs, and God said, sit in it. That's faith, because it defies logic. But to look at it and say, well, it's got four legs, it's sturdy. I've seen Brother Doug sit in it before. I think it's going to hold me. Although that's... A, that's not valid in my I weigh more than Brother Doug, so that's not a guarantee. It could break when I sit in it. Right? But I've sat in that pew for who knows how long. I believe that it's going to hold me. No. That's logic. When it doesn't have legs, and you say, well, yeah, I believe it'll hold me up. That's not faith. I can say it all day long. Faith is when I commit myself to do it and actually sit down in the chair. Well, do you believe that chair would hold me up? Yeah, because God told me. Doesn't do you any good until you actually sit in it. Faith takes a little bit of action. If you really believed that God was dealing with your heart, 
that you were a sinner and needed a Savior, if you had faith that Jesus was the one, you got up out of the pew and accepted him as Savior. Or in my case, got up out of a bunk bed and met, the, met your pastor down in the garage and got saved in the garage. Right? There were works that went along with it. Because if you really believe it, you'll do it. Some people, it doesn't even occur to them the option to not tithe. Why? Because that's God's money. God gave the money to me. It's all His. And He instructs me to give them a tithe and an offering on top of it. It doesn't occur to them. Because if they believe it, well, why would I want to keep God's money? But if God really wants you to go witness to that person, if you really believed it, you'd do it. Because part of faith is humility. Part of faith is submitting yourself to God because you realize He's greater than me. He must increase. I must decrease. Faith really comes from, do you, do you believe the Bible? Do you believe that God's omniscient, that He's omnipotent, that He's omnipresent, that He orchestrates things to where people come into your life for a specific reason, because you're an epistle known and read of all men, so that you can be a witness to others? If you really believed it, when God told you, go give that person a track, you do it. Because if you believe the book, you're not believing man, you're not believing the preacher, you're believing that a holy God wrote a holy book to show you how to live a life pleasing before him. So when he says, go witness, that's not a suggestion. That's the king of glory asking me to do something for him. Of course I'm going to do it. Some people have enough faith to come into church, but that's not a work. What is that? That's obedience. We're supposed to be in the house of God when the doors are open. God blesses obedience, but the just shall live by faith. If your faith is dead, your life's dead. Can't live without it. Because without faith, it's impossible to please Him. But see, faith... Is not saying, well, I believe it, so I'm going to prove it to you by my word. That process doesn't happen in your head. Faith is, God said to do it, I'm going to do it. There is no, well, I've said that I believe that for years, so I have to do it at least once. That's not faith. That's you being afraid of looking like a hypocrite. Faith isn't, well, God said to do it, but I'll do it tomorrow. Well, if you really believe that he's God, you'd do it now. Because God does all things well. His ways are above our ways. His timing's always perfect. But see, some of us believe in part. Or some of us believe without connecting the dots. The same God that wrote James wrote Galatians. The same God that wrote Galatians wrote 1 Kings. Same spirit that inspired men to write in the Old Testament, inspired people to write in the New Testament. It all fits together. That's why there's 66 books and not 65. That's why there's an Old and a New Testament, not just 27 books in the New Testament. I mean, again, I don't know why I'm stuck in Galatians 3, but Galatians 3, the law is our schoolmaster. It brought us to the knowledge of Christ. What did the law do? The law convinced us or gave us faith to know I'm not holy. Because if you really believe that, you're looking for a Savior. The law was to bring us under conviction to show us that we did not meet up to God's standards. And those that really believed it lived as God instructed them to. And most of them did it without a book. Most of them did it without the ability to sit down and say, well, Lord, what does your word say? They just did it off of faith. They said, well, Lord, the psalm that we might have taken encouragement from may not have been written yet. But David, in those times of hardship, said, Lord, I believe you anyway. And then in hindsight, he went back and wrote those psalms. And when he's going through it, he wrote them songs to encourage himself in the Lord like he did at Ziklag. Well, he said, those that have faith, they live it. It's not a matter of, well, I believe it, so what am I going to do today to prove it? No, no, no. If you believe it, it's just second nature. There is no thought process. That's logic. That's trying to convince people. Faith just does it. Why? Because God said so. 
Not because, well, I think that this is what Brother Doug would want me to do. No, no, no. What does God want you to do? Because see, that's the thing about soul liberty. Soul liberty being that, well, God gave us all these doctrines that everybody should live by. But God's going to give you personal convictions. God's going to give you a personal thing to do for God. Because, I mean, we could go and look at the adoption of sonship. Again, I'm back in Galatians again. I don't know why. But in Galatians, Bible talks about a son until he reaches the age or when it's his appointed time to take over the father's estate. A son is really a servant. He's got schoolmasters. He's got instructors. He's got people that are over him, whether they're tutors or whether they're nannies or things like that. Well, I've received the adoption of sonship, but my, it's not appointed time for Jordan to reign. We'd all be in a mess. I promise you that. Like Bruce Almighty was funny, but it'd be a disaster. Okay, I promise you. You don't want that. Why? Because he still, as the song says, working on me. I'm a son, but I'm also a servant. I do as the Father asks me to do or instructs me to do because the Father knows best. But see, the way that he asks me, the way that he instructs me is through the Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Well, how do we talk to God? Through prayer. Well, if you really believed that God was giving you the instruction that you need for your daily life, you'd be in here looking for the Spirit to speak back to you. If you really believed that God led you and guides you by the Spirit, you'd be in here looking for direction. Well, I believe that God's going to work all this out. Well, are you looking for the answer? Because if you have faith that God's going to work it out, you'll be committed to prayer. Some of y'all might even get to the point where you're committed to fasting until you get the answer from God. By out of faith that God's going to do it, but I want to show God how serious I am. What is it? That's faith... But then that's just doubling down on your faith. Faith is, well, I'm going to give God what's God's even when I need the money to pay the bill. Because I believe God will work it out. Faith is, well, the Spirit told me to do it, so no matter how much people tell me it's not a good idea, no matter how much the world tries to convince me that it doesn't make sense, I'm just going to do it. Not to prove to them that I'm better in there, it has nothing to do with me or them. It's because God told me to do it. Amen. Faith is black and white, just like the Word of God. Either you do or you don't do. Either you believe or you don't. It's not a matter of knowing. It's a matter of having faith in it. Well, do you believe that the Holy Spirit has your best interest in it? Then do what the Word tells you to do. Do you really believe that Man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Because if you believe that, you'll be in here every morning. Amen. Early will I seek thee. Amen. If you really believe it, you'll engrave the words yes. of the Bible onto the fleshy tables of your heart. Amen. You'll commit it unto yourself because you know, well, if it's that important to God, it needs to be that important to me. What are you saying? I'm saying if you believe it, you'll live it. Because faith without works is dead, but if your faith is alive, you'll do it. But what's dead faith look like? Well, I believe that God wants that person to do it. Well, if God gave the ministry to this church, that means everybody ought to be involved. Well, maybe you can't go. Well, see, that's the thing about faith. My legs may not work. My health may fail me and I may not be able to go or be able to do. Or I may be just so busy that I can't do physically. God knows I can't add anything else to my plate. But see, if God's really doing it, I believe that prayer can get the job done. I believe that stuffing bags with tracks that they go out and hang on doors is good. Why? Because by faith, I'm putting these into these bags because I know God wants to use it to help somebody. My faith allows me to put the supplies in so that those that go can take and go. You do read that there were those that ministered unto Jesus and his disciples. What did they do? They knew, I, I'm not the Son of God. A lot of them you'll find are women. What did they do? Well, I can't go and preach the messages that Jesus is preaching. 
but I believe he's the Son of God, and I don't want the Son of God to go without. And God gave to me more and better than I deserve, so I'm going to give it back to the Son of God. What was that? It's just faith. They say that Mary Magdalene, the one who Jesus cast seven devils out of, they say that the country that she came from, Magdala, which is where Magdalene comes from, Mary of Magdala. They say that was a very wealthy region. And I mean, could you imagine somebody that had everything that the world could offer you but was miserable because of the seven devils that were inside of her? Well, you find that she follows Jesus around ministering. You can't convince me that she didn't take all that she had and did what that rich young ruler did, sell it off, and she just gave it all back to God. Well, I heard the Lord was coming by this way. I'm going to make sure that he's got a place to stay, that he's got food, that him and his disciples are going to be comfortable while they're here. Because he may have taken them all the way. He must, may have must needs had to go on through Samaria. They may be a little tired by the time they get here. I'm going to make sure that they can rest up. What's that? That's just faith. Don't find her ever asking for anything. Don't find her saying, well, Lord, I can give this to you today, but I'm going to need it back tomorrow. That's not faith. It's not faith saying, well, I can live without this for about three weeks and then my car payment's due. That's not faith. What's that? That's giving to get. If you're just giving for the notoriety of giving, just like the Pharisee that prayed out loud in the temple, you've got your reward. But those that give, what did the widowed woman give? Two mites. But she gave all. Why? Because she said, Lord... I've made a mess of everything that I had. And this is all I've got left. Now I've come to the realization that you can do anything. I can't even make this half a penny in today's money, which by the time they studied that was probably less than that. Because most people that quote that, that's an old reference book. Probably less than that because of inflation and everything else. She just said, Lord, you can do a whole lot more with this than I can. By faith, this is all I've got because I've ruined the rest of it. Maybe she went out begging and that's all that they gave her that day. Lord, I can't even rely on other bit, but I can rely on you. Amen. But what Jesus said, faith. Everything in the New Testament, everything in the Old Testament, those that were rewarded by God, what did they do? They lived by faith. That Syrophoenician woman, what did Jesus say? Haven't found faith like this in all of Israel. What did that centurion, Dries, what did he say to the Lord? He said, Lord, you don't even have to come see my sick daughter. Then after he finds out that she's dead, he says, you don't even need to show up and touch her. He says, I'm a centurion. I've got soldiers and servants underneath me. If I tell them to do it, it's going to be done. He says, I know it. Because they respect me, I have the authority. He said, you're the son of God. You say it, it's just going to be done. You've got authority over everything. What was that? It was faith, and Christ rewarded it. His faith brought him from the Roman quarter to the Jewish quarter. His faith didn't let the crowd stand in the way. His faith, when Christ said, all right, well, I'll go to your house. Lord, I'm not even worthy for you to do that. But I do know you're all powerful, and you just say the word, it'll be done. He says, I understand there are people that need you more than I do. Just say the word. What's that? That's somebody that's humble. Somebody that has faith and somebody who acted on that faith. You can be under conviction until the cows come home. But unless you act and do something about it, you're going to stay miserable and under conviction. You can believe that, well, I know that Jesus will forgive me. Well, unless you ask him, he can't. That's part of repentance. I have to turn from it. I have to admit, Lord, I know I was wrong, not because I got myself into a mess. I was wrong because I went against what your word said. And by repentance, I'm saying, I now know that I was wrong, and I've purposed not to do it again. Well, if I never ask for the forgiveness, I cannot repent. If there's unrepentant sin in my life, that's something between me and God. Well, if you really had faith, you'd get the unrepentant sin out of your life. If you believed that this Bible and the things that it says bring enmity between me and God, if you really believed that, you'd get the sin out. 
Because that's a holy God and I'm one that's not holy and I need all of him that I can get. Well, dead faith says, well, that's not impacting my relationship between me and God. Well, you know, it, there are only so many UK games throughout the year. I can go to church whenever I want. Well, maybe now you can. But you want to know something? Won't miss the water until the well runs dry. You got to get the drink now, because I don't know what tomorrow holds. I mean, if you really believe that today was the that today was the day that the Lord has made, you'd be looking for anybody that you could to tell about Jesus. If you really believe that there was no tomorrow because God hadn't made it yet, you'd be telling everybody that you knew, "Hey, today might be your last opportunity." But dead faith says, "Well, there's always later." Not if God says do it now. Because God is omnipresent. That means that he's in yesterday, he's already in tomorrow, but tomorrow could be the beginning of eternity. Amen. The rapture could happen today and then we're out of here. Tomorrow could be my last day. Y'all might still be here. But there's a number on each one of our heads. Right. God put it there. God's been known to change it. But God's also been known not to. There came a day when Elijah knew, hey, I'm going, going to cross this river, taking Elisha with me. And when I get to the other side of the river, he says, my day's come. I'm pretty sure he didn't know what was going to happen, but he knew God's going to take me out of here. So I told Elisha that if you stay with me until God takes me, that he'd receive the double portion. He said, I know I'm going out of here. But you know what Elijah did the rest of that day? He still lived by faith. He got to the river. What did he do? He smacked the waters with his coat. He said, God, if you told me to cross that river, I believe you're going to let me cross on dry, dry ground. Faith is not an on and off switch. Faith will not allow you, if, you truly be, if you're convinced of it. That's what the word conviction means. That God has convinced you of it. If you're convinced of it, you're going to live it. Because God told you that. We all look at some people like they're crazy because of some of the things that they do. But some of them have just been convinced by God to do it. Who am I to say anything different? Some people are just convinced that, you know what, TV's not all that important. I'd rather read my Bible. Some people are just convinced that unless God himself comes down out of heaven and keeps them from coming to church, they're going to be here. Which is what providentially hindered means. God allowed it to happen to keep me from coming to church. Some people are convinced that no matter all the hardness, no matter what the world or the family or maybe even people in the church can do to them, they're just going to be faithful. They're going to keep praying. going to keep studying going to keep going out and handing out tracts no matter how many people reject them. Why? Because God's convinced them in their heart that it is true. That is alive faith. Dead faith is conditional. Dead faith is circumstantial. Dead faith is contingent on how I feel. But faith that is alive does not change. Because the one that convinced you of it does not change. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His ways change not. He's the one that told Moses, I am. And Moses was so convinced of it that he went back and told Israel, I am sent me. Moses was so convinced of it that when Pharaoh's magicians and everything else tried to replicate everything that God did, Moses just kept coming back and telling Pharaoh. Moses just kept coming back and telling Pharaoh, I believe he pleaded with Pharaoh. God, God's going to do something. He says, up until now, people have been hurt. They may have been stung by bugs. may have gotten a little thirsty because the water was turned to blood. Right, the locusts may have ate the crops, but you all got a pretty good you know, meat supply for a while. He said, but something's, God's going to do something to break your heart, Pharaoh. And he says, I believe it. 
I believe he went to them with compassion. I don't believe he went and said, hey, let God's people go or God's going to do something bad. Pharaoh, God said that his people are leaving. He says, please let them go. God said, let my people go. It, just, just do it. He says, you know, he says, I know the conviction. I got it. He said, he broke my heart on the backside of that mountain when he spoke to me out of the fiery bush. He says, I don't want him to break your heart like he broke mine. Because that's what Moses is doing for all them years. He's out there under conviction for what he did. That's why he ran. God showed up and said, Moses, you can get it made right. Moses had to submit Moses, kill off who he used to be and say, all right, Lord, I'll be what you want me to be. Those people that really believe, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. If you really believe that, you'll live like the new creature. Amen. I don't want the flesh. Right. What can the flesh do for me? Nothing. I mean, that's, what, that's why Galatians 3 popped into my mind. If you, were, if you received the Spirit by faith, why in the world would you try and do works in the flesh? If you received salvation by faith, for by grace are you saved through faith. If you went and accepted what Christ said He would do for you by faith, why would you ever do it any other way? Who in here had to get a theology degree before you could get saved? I mean, there are some people in here got saved, didn't even know how to read. There's some in here that got saved before they could even spell some of the words that are in the Bible. Some of y'all still can't spell Nebuchadnezzar. Right? A little help for you. It's spelled, you don't say it this way, but it's spelled Nebuchadnezzar. That's how I remember it. That's how you say it. That's how you spell it. What's the point? God doesn't look at our limitations. He looks at our availability, one, but our ability to reject what makes sense and embrace faith. As soon as by faith you stepped out and said, I want Christ, I believe that's when you got saved. Why? Because it's not in the prayer. It's not in the works. There may, there's some people, they still got questions. They need to come to the altar. Somebody needs to take the Bible and answer those questions for them so that they can put their faith in Christ. Because at that point, they're like that woman saying, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. But see, once, you, once in your heart you purpose, I'm going to accept it. That's when you get saved. It's not in the water, not in the words. What is it? It's in the action of saying, I believe it enough that I'm going to do it. If the preacher has to compel you in order to do it, it's not faith. Do you have to be guilted into doing it by somebody else? That's not faith. That's obligation. And if you're obligated to do it, you're really not doing it for him, you're doing it for you. So that you feel better. That's not faith. Faith is, if nobody else shows up, I'm going to do it anyway. Why? Because it's been settled deep down in my soul. That's faith that's alive. Faith that's alive will have you walking around Jericho once a day and then seven times on the seventh day. This don't make sense. How are we going to get into a city by walking around a city? Well, we're not going to do nothing. God said do it. We're going to do it. What happened? God opened up the earth and the walls disappeared. Walls didn't come tumbling down. God just swallowed them up. But, but what did Moses say? Stand still and see the salvation. He didn't say turn around and start fighting until God does something. Stand still and watch God send a wind so strong it splits the sea in half. And then dries the ground. Or, like Abraham. Alright Lord, I'll sacrifice them because I believe that you'll raise them up from the dead. You really know what he was saying? He was saying God would take the ash pile that was left of them and make them into a person again. Because that was the one, Isaac, that God promised him. He said, I believe God keeps his promises so much that he's going to keep it even after he tells me to sacrifice him. His promise is his promise. His word endures forever. He's going to give them back to me. Hebrews tells us that Abraham was just look, looking around for a city whose builder and maker was God. 
Why? Because God promised it to him. And then one day he got it. It's called heaven. One day he'll get to see new heaven, new earth. That one was handcrafted, built by God for those that by faith accepted him. Real faith isn't saying, well, I believe it. Real faith is doing it because God's convinced you of it. And James is saying, if you're convinced, if you believe that God really wants to help that person, you do it because you know God will take care of it in the end. If you really believe that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, you'll get the Word of God out to everybody. Maybe not everybody in the world, but everybody you can. If you really believe that God gave you your job to shine as a light on the job for God, you'll do everything on the job as unto Christ. If you really believe that this is the church that God puts you in, it would take an act of God to keep you either from not coming or from leaving. Because God does lead other people away. But what's that? God's got to convince them of it, just like he convinced them to join it. Where's all that happen? In here. Where's all that happen? In here. How's all that happen? Through the cords of loving kindness that the Spirit uses to work on us. Because he doesn't convince you of all these things by beating you over the head with it. He doesn't convince you of all these things by writing it in the sky. He convinces you of it by saying, one, I love you, and this is what's best for you. True faith is not seeing the other half. Not seeing the other side, but just believing that, well, God said it was best for me. I'm going to do it. Because I'd rather believe God than do what makes sense to me. I'd rather do what the world laughs at so that one day I can have a little bit extra to lay down at the feet of Jesus and say, I did this for you. I loved you more than the approval of the world. I loved you more than the association of people. I loved you enough that I actually did it. You can't convince me that Jonah didn't believe that God was God. He was a prophet. But he wasn't convinced of the fact that Nineveh needed God or that Nineveh deserved to hear from God. Well, how do you know? There was a big revival and everybody from the king down to the beggar got saved. And Jonah got mad at God for forgiving him. He had faith that God was God, but he didn't have faith that God could forgive whoever God wanted to forgive. But it took the same amount of blood that Christ shed on Calvary to forgive the worst offender as it did me. And I believe that he did it for me. I can believe all I want to that he did it for you, but that's not going to help you. You've got to have the faith that he did it for you and then act on it. Believing that he can save you or will save you isn't enough. You've got to receive it. And James is saying, you take those people's works away from them, they're miserable, they got nothing. But you can take my works from me. I may be laid up in a bed, I could be in a coma. But if I come out of it or when I got the glory, I promise you, I was still happy. I was content in what the Lord had given me. Why? Because it wasn't based off of the work. I did because of what I believed. You take my works, I've still got my faith. If I can't do it, I could still be convinced of it deep down here in the gable end of my soul. Those that couldn't do in the Bible, they just did what they could do. Woman with the issue of blood. She didn't even want to disturb the Lord. She's believed, yeah, if I can just get to the hem of his garment. I don't even need to ask him. He's so holy, if I can just get to him, he'll take care of the unholiness in me. What's that? Faith. Faith enough to crawl through a crowd of people. Faith enough that she didn't let the press stand between her and God. Why do you think the Bible says like a childlike faith? What did Jesus say to his disciples? Suffer not the little children. Why? Because they believed him enough to go to him. And the disciples tried to keep him from getting there. Because childlike faith just says, well, if I believe it, I'm going to do it. Childlike faith says, well, that's Jesus. I'm going to get to him. 
Because the childlike faith doesn't have the boundaries that we have. Well, what, what will people think? Who cares? That's Jesus. Well, what are people going to say about Who cares? That's Jesus. Well, what if I stub my toe or I, get, I trip when I'm going? Who cares? That's Jesus. If you can get to him, everything will be fine. Amen. Well, it's the same after we get saved. Who cares? God said it. The rule around here is whatsoever he said, do it. But see, there's a contingency there. A lot of times he says, but we don't do because we're not convinced of it. That's dead faith. A live faith is not just whatsoever he says, do it. What, regardless of what it is that he says, do it. Regardless of who's watching, do it. Regardless of how it makes your flesh feel, do it. Because that's faith that's alive. That's faith that, like Christ said, can move mountains. That's faith that's just about the side of grain of mustard seed. May not be much, but it's enough to cause you to move and you to act. That faith is strong enough to move mountains. Because if it can move the flesh, what's the flesh made out of? Dirt. What's the mountain made out of? Dirt. Because if you really believed it, that God would do it, that's why he said it. You could say, to that mountain, be cast into the sea. And because of the faith that you had, that's why it would have happened. You didn't do it. God did it. So many people are willing to go out and say, well, I wish God would move this mountain. But they're not willing to do the simple things that God's tried to convince them of for years. And they could say they have faith, but they don't. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.